I was going to ask about, obviously, the original script. Were any moments, dialogue, sort of scenes that you can vividly remember? That's, you know, the original script had way better jokes that James wrote about the ascot and they hit they hit hard they hit fred's soul in that original script and when we got out there they they kind of switched scripts on us which was unfortunate hello mate how are you uh getting better a tree landed on my house this morning but other than that i'm fantastic oh my god <laughs> oh bloody i mean as long as you're okay but is that much is it like crushed anything is it I, we don't know yet but it was big and it was loud i was in the shower at like six in the morning and i heard what i thought was someone fall and usually i'm the first one up so i jump out of the shower and i'm looking around and i'm listening i don't hear anything i don't see anything everyone's asleep I go downstairs to let my dogs outside in the backyard and I open the door and just see this huge tree from my neighbor's yard just on top of our house. Is that is it because of the weather in LA? Yeah, this, LA is just not built for rain, period. I mean, you're talking to a man from London here. If we don't have rain for like two days, we're like, fuck it, it's a drought, we're all gonna die. Yeah, that's like Seattle in America, yeah. <laughs> Annoyingly, I'm actually going to LA in like two weeks time, so I'm hoping it clears up by then, otherwise I've just spent a lot of money to sit indoors. No, I think you'll be all right. I think you'll be all right. I think, we're, I think we'll be through it at the end of this week. Good, thank you. I'm taking your word on that. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Obviously, there's a lot I want to talk to you about, but first there's something I have to say, and that is happy birthday for the other day. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I may be like the, the last person who said happy 47th birthday or the first person say happy 48th birthday. I'd like to think the latter. Yeah, go go with first for next year. You beat my wife, my kids, my mother. You beat them all. I'm probably the most important person in your life right now because of that, right? This year. Yeah, this year. I'll take that. But from 48 to 49, you're going to be out again. Well, you know what? Happy birthday for then. Happy birthday for your 50th. Happy birthday for your 50th. You know what? I'm in your good books for a while. You will be. You will be. So what did you do for it? And uh, more importantly, did anyone buy you a uh, Luchador wrestling mask to add to your collection? No one buys me Luchador masks. And I think it's because they worry I won't like the ones they get me. But I love all Luchador masks. I mean, I have a lot. I have like other kinds of masks too, like superhero masks and a mask from They Live, which they didn't use in They Live. They used cool prosthetics, but it's a mask to look like that. So I, I just love masks, period. So that's always a good gift. But uh, but no, I went out to a nice little dinner with my family and uh, a friend of mine who I haven't seen in 15 years surprised us, or well, my wife made sure that he surprised us. And uh, we had a nice little family dinner and then went home and, and put the kids to bed and all that. I'm not a party guy at all I, I not even in my 20s was i so i i'd like to keep things calm and chill and and as small as possible i'm so pleased you said that because now that i know i've got to come to your next birthday being the closest one in your life i don't want a big night out either i really want an early night a nice sleep yeah we'll get you to bed by nine you'll be good oh you're such a dream i'm so pleased i wish you happy birthday now <laughs> I want to talk about, I know what you did last summer, but I am a massive wuss when it comes to horror films. So luckily, and this is going to be a seamless plug, bud, I could listen to your podcast. That was pretty scary to get me through it. See, genius. Thank you. What made you uh, want to make the podcast? I have a friend who is more obsessed with horror films than even me. And that's my, my podcast partner, John Lee Brody on the podcast. And I had spoken with these, with the wonderful women at Morbid, um, who have that whole podcast network there. And they were even talking about like movies and things like that. And we tossed a couple ideas back and forth and nothing really came from it. And uh, a few months later, John and I were talking and I already have one podcast called Wrestling with Freddie, uh, where I talk like pro wrestling. That's why I have all the luchador masks because I love that still even at, at my advanced age. Um, but yeah, so I had already had one and we were watching a horror movie and he was like, 
he goes, dude, we should just do a podcast about horror movies. And I was like, I was about to say the exact same thing. And we both were kind of sitting there like, well, what would it be? And we wanted to make sure it was only movies that we loved. We don't want to like trash anything. Um, and fortunately I love almost every horror movie made. Um, and then I, I called the, the women at, uh, at morbid again and said, Hey, what about if I did a podcast about, you know, all the horror movies I've seen, and this is my buddy, he's James Wan's protege. He really knows his, his, uh, I said his, his, we'll say his stuff, but I said a different word and, uh, they, they were so easy. They were like, that sounds great. Let's do it. And so we, we made a deal as quickly as possible and, and started recording right away. But yeah, that's where it all kind of came is just, he and I were sitting down watching an old horror movie and he's like, and at the same time, we both wanted to be like, yo, we should talk about this on a microphone. As I said, thank you. Cause I, I reckon I watch like a mildly scary film, like once a year. So you make me sound knowledgeable. Now I just basically copy what you say on the podcast and say it to other people. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Someone's going to copy parts of your interview here <laughs> that you procured and <laughs> and aggregate it to their site and you'll be the one that's robbed. So we can all just rob each other. It's fine. You've got a lot higher expectation about me than I think I do there. No one's robbing what I'm saying. I, I told you you're number one this year. In your face, Sarah, you loser. But I watched, um, I watched The Menu. That's Ooh. about as scary as it got for me this year. Oh my God. God, Ray Fiennes can do no wrong in my eyes. No, Ray Fiennes, I first discovered in a Catherine Bigelow movie called Strange Days, um, which is him and Angela Bassett. Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Angela Bassett did the thing. Uh, the late Tom Sizemore and Juliette Lewis, who just kills it. And I didn't know who this guy was, thought he was an American actor never seen him in anything. And since Strange Days, I have watched every film that that man has ever been in. And even if the film wasn't something I connected with, his performance, you, as an actor, it's like going to acting class and having a teacher be so great that you're like, well, I'm gonna quit because I'm not gonna be that good. As a fan, you're so compelled to just watch every single thing he does and uh to get to be on both sides of that with an artist especially when you're you're in the same field and and to look at him the way i look at him he like you said he can do no wrong and he was so great in that i think we even yeah we did that movie on on the podcast it'll come i think it's like our fifth or sixth episode because we just loved it so much but just the beginning of that movie just starting with fire and her lighting the cigarette and the end of the movie ending in fire and purification. I was just like, oh God, what flaming bookends for this amazing movie that I just watched. I loved it. I loved every second of it. And I think only with him can you get something as like, you could say to him, by the way, this film's going to end with you putting marshmallows on everyone's head. Anyone else you go, oh, this is stupid. But because it's very fine, you're like, this is art. Harry Potter, we're going to cover your nose up, make you bald and a snake man. But because it's very fine, you're like, this is incredible. But he earns it. He he earns it through the first, second, and third act. You know, he he's so credible, and he's he's been so honestly over dramatic about every dish they're serving that he's earned your respect. So that when he says, "Here's dessert, you're a s'more, and I'm lighting you on fire, you toasty little creatures," it, it was written better than that you don't care like you're just like yes burn them let them melt those pretentious a-holes that were all perfectly cast i mean every single role perfectly cast i just i we're gonna just do an hour on this movie i mean i just loved it i loved it you're right especially nicholas holt like watching that i wanted to go through the screen and slap him in his little face the whole time and and that's what and so many actors i don't think would have the courage to play what people on social media called the beta personality, right? Like, oh, he's a beta, he's a beta. Like there's so much pressure on artists now to be what the fans want instead of what the artist feels inside. So for him to have the guts to pull that off at a 100%, never tried to be the tough guy ever, unless it was to the girl that he felt stronger than, who ends up, you know, being better than everyone. It just kudos to him, kudos to everyone in that cast. It was just beautifully, beautifully performed.
Well, you said that that's going to be another episode on your podcast, but obviously the first one was I Know What You Did Last Summer. Yeah. How are you watching yourself back? Do you like cringe and die a little inside watching yourself? It was the first time I ever saw the movie. I've only seen now four movies that I've done. I Know What You Did being the fourth. I don't really dig... <laughs> I don't like my face that much, so I don't want to see it on screen. Like, I have a post-it over the screen on our Zoom call so that I only see your face and I don't see mine because I'm not good with technology and I don't know which button to press to get rid of my face. So uh, so yeah, that's, and that's why I changed my voice and like a lot of the voice work that I did because I don't like my voice either. So I would rather watch other people do it. I'd rather watch Ray Fiennes do it and be amazed and awed than, you know, I was there, I read the script, I know how it ends. A lot of times, you know, once it's done, you kind of, rid yourself of the character so that you can open yourself up for the next character, right? And it's not in a bad way or a disrespectful way. It's just necessary as an artist, as an actor to do that. You have to kind of strip away all that. Otherwise, certain parts of those performances carry on into others. And that maybe is a good thing, but at least from my perspective, that's never worked for me. So yeah, so I had never, I had never seen it. So that's why John said it has to be our first one. He's like, cause people really get a kick out of that. Like you're just experiencing it for the first time. So that, it was crazy though. It, cause it, it shot so wonderfully. And the opening shot is just drop dead gorgeous off a helicopter. And it's the same cliffs where they shot the birds, Alfred Hitchcock's the birds. So it had a lot of historical meaning to me too. That whole like opening sequence down there by the beach. That's all where they shot that. We stayed in the hotel that they shot the movie at. Like it was awesome. Like it was awesome. And I just such a history buff on, on the, on genre films like that. So it was just every day. We were only there two weeks. The rest of the time was North Carolina, which doesn't have the horror history, I would say. Um, but it was still fine. Hitchcock had lunch there once. Ooh. Oh yeah, I heard it was amazing. Yeah, I know. Obviously, when that uh, I know what he did last summer was released, another horror slasher, Scream, was released around the same time. Yeah, which obviously starred your buddy Matthew Lillard in it. <laughs> Do you two ever compete as to whose horror slasher is better? N no, I auditioned for Scream, and it came down to me, Skeet, and one other guy. And I remember on like the producer session, which is the one right before the final audition. When I was done, they said, hey, when you do it for Wes, have a little bit more edge to it. And I remember walking out of there and just shaking my head and can I curse? Yeah, fill your boots. So, <laughs> so I remember walking out of there and going, I'm fucked. <laughs> Cause I was like, I was 19, I had no edge. I came up in like martial arts under Bob Wall and Gene LaBelle and Pat Johnson and all those guys. So I was humbled on a weekly basis. I, I took orders from, from my teachers, you know, and it just wasn't within me. And then I see Skeet and he's just like the edgiest of edge, right? And I was like, um, hmm, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna get this role. And, uh, and I didn't, but I didn't even know Matt then. I didn't meet Matt until where did we meet? She's all, yeah, she's all that I think was the first one. And Matt and I always worked well together, but we aren't like friends. I don't mean we're enemies. I just mean like, I don't have his number. He doesn't have my number for whatever reason. But anytime I bump into him, we always give each other a big hug. I saw him randomly in Detroit in an elevator and we were staying in the same hotel and the doors open. And I was just like, Matt? He was like, bro, and just gave me like a big old hug. So it's love when we see each other, but we just, we are, we're not super tight like that. That's all. He's doing a bit more horror now. I think he's going to star in like a, a Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Oh, cool. Is he going to be the bad guy? He's the guy that created all of the animatronics that go on the killing spree. Oh, he'll love, he'll love that. They'll eat that up. Horror movies are also your baby as well. Would you like to one day be the monster, be the bad guy, like maybe even maybe like an iconic character like Dracula or Creature from the Black Lagoon, something like that. I love that question. By the way, Creature from the Black Lagoon was the first horror movie that I ever saw. Um, when my mom took me to Universal Studios as a little boy, 
uh, they used to have actors dress up as all the original Universal monsters. So Frankenstein, Dracula, the mummy, creature from the Black Lagoon, who was never there. Um, but uh, I remember all the, my mom told me this, I don't remember. She said all the young kids were crawling over their parents to get away from the monster. She said, you crawled over me to pet Frankenstein so that I could pet his face. And uh, so I've always loved monsters. And I remember I met Ron Perlman once at like San Diego Comic Con. And it was right after he had done Hellboy. And I said, all I've ever wanted was to have your career. Because Ron Perlman wasn't just Hellboy. He was this preacher figure in Island of Dr. Moreau. He was Beast in the live action version of Beauty and the Beast with Linda Hamilton from Terminator. So I said that to him, I go, I always wanted your career. And he goes, this business would never let you do that. It's just because I was like some pretty boy, like wuss bag that they would just never put a mask on ever. So I remember, I remember taking that in and being like, yeah, they're not going to let me do that. But I would love to, you know, I would love to be the monster. I would, that would be tons of fun. I, that's everybody wants to get away with that. You know, it's like when I was a kid, I rooted for the bad guys in wrestling because they would cheat and they never got caught ever. The only time Vince McMahon let the good guy win was when you paid 50 bucks for the pay-per-view and my mom wasn't gonna, we didn't have any money. Like she was on free TV, the bad guys won. So I was always like, yeah, Iron Sheik, let's go, man. Like, I just didn't care. So yeah, I love the bad guys. I love the monsters. I, I like when they get away with it. I like when they, they kill all the pretty people. It's just, those are, that's my favorite stuff. You're so much cooler than me. I remember <laughs> I went to Universal when I was like, nine and we went on the jaws ride yeah that has traumatized me to this day. like i remember when I, again i was back now i didn't get in the bath for a year because i was like that shark's popping out you're not alone I, my one of my closest friends wouldn't was scared of the his swimming pool and his bathtub and i remember being like he can't swim through the drain like and but in his brain he was like it didn't matter the, the shark was in the in the water it didn't matter what kind of water. But mechanical sharks are very deadly, so you should stay away from them. Thank you. Oh, you're such a good egg for not making me feel like the wimp that I know I am. I think more people are killed per year by mechanical sharks than from smoking. So it's, I think your fears are warranted. Oh, well, now I know that I'm going to go out smoking like a chimney. I'm a positive influence on everybody. I know there's talks of the I Know What You Did Last Summer sequel. And, you know, I've seen everyone saying like, you're in it, you're in it. But I saw an interview with you where you said like, You've not officially signed on yet. Is that still the case? I haven't been offered anything. Um, I know they said they did, but I think that was original films just doing a, like a publicity thing. I don't think there was any like malice attached. I hope they weren't trying to do that so I would feel obligated to. But uh, I don't think they did that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I haven't been offered anything. I did sit with uh, the director, Jen Robinson. Who I respect a lot. She did Do Revenge that my uh, my wife was in for Netflix and I watched that and thought she tells very interesting stories. Um, so we sat and spoke and we had a good positive conversation but as of this moment at 10 16 a.m. I still haven't been offered anything. I haven't spoken to the studio. I haven't spoken to the production company. Only, only Jen who I love very much. I think she's awesome. What would you like from a sequel that make you sign on the dotted line? What would be a dream for you? It's one or the other, right? It's either you go all the way supernatural, which I don't think works for, I know you did last summer because it was more rooted in reality, like Scream. Um, so then I think it just has to be super duper organic. Like you can't bring anyone back from the dead. You can't, I would love Ryan and Sarah to be back and Jack Black too, but, and Makai. But, but no, they can't come back. It has to be rooted in reality. And I think you have to uh, focus on the next generation. You know, I appreciate the love. And if, if something, if it's something cool that, that I like, and I feel like I can add something to, and I feel like they genuinely want me in the movie, then, then yeah, it's more likely I would, I would do it depending on schedule, when and where, and how long I got to be away from my kids. But you know, there's other situations where that just won't, oops, sorry, where that just doesn't play. You know what I mean? That there was a reason, there were reasons I didn't do the She's All That sequel. You know what I mean? They, we certainly spoke about it, but it just didn't work at the end of the day for me. And uh, yeah, so if, if they were cool with it, cool. Otherwise I would say 
focus on the next generation find some more young actors every once in a while you get horror films that kind of launched the careers of the of the group right and scream did it i know you did last summer did it look at jamie lee curtis winning an academy award you know what i mean like it it's done so much johnny depp from nightmare on elm street you know the whole by the way the whole cast in that movie is great they had to loop a lot but but the casting was beautiful in that from Tina to Rod to ever, I just remember their names. I'm such a dork, but you know, I think horror has always been a good launching pad because it tells the truth pretty quick. Cause they, they, they accept more outlandish performances that aren't rooted. So you get like a lot of the Roger Corman, like B movies, which I love, but the performances wouldn't be of a Ray Fiennes quality. Right? So when you do get a horror film that has stronger performances, I've always feel those stand out more than the others. And and it's a great launching pad. It was for us anyway. So and I think history would show that as well. Prior to this possible sequel and Christmas with you, you hadn't acted in a long time. And I'm think now that you're back in it, let's keep the ball rolling. What have we got to do to make you a wrestling movie? <laughs> well, I, I've written something in the wrestling space that I will eventually do. Um, hopefully in the next, within the next year, I hope. Uh, but the wrestling business is crazy and I'm still learning about it. It's much different than Hollywood and Hollywood producers don't really get it. And the changes they want to make are usually horrible because they don't understand wrestling or don't worse. They don't respect it as an art form. Um, so then the notes are just terrible. So you got to walk this fine line or you got to just say, I'm doing it without Hollywood. I'm going to create the promotion, find the TV deal and, and do my thing, but I'm definitely involved in it and heavily invested. Um, I've, I've written something. It's been well received. I just didn't want to make the changes that they wanted where it was going to be. And so we just politely parted ways without anybody getting mad at anybody. And, and then nobody has to change their whole, their whole show. Uh, so we'll, we'll see, but I can't say too much in that space. Cause it's like, if ink's not on paper, it's all bullshittery, so to speak. It, it, you know what I mean? Like until, until there's an actual contract, it's just wishful thinking. And if you release that energy, you don't have that energy anymore and you're less motivated. You're less aggressive. You're more likely to go, oh, yeah. So I try to keep as much of it inside. Although I know there's wrestling fans out there that want to know everything, but I can't, I can't give you everything where I got nothing left. So, so it's tricky. I want to give people something, but it's with that, that's my baby. So I, I, I just can't do it, man. I can't. Well, I'm going to pitch one thing to you. Hit me with it. I heard you say in an interview that you've got a mate who's built like a wrestler and that is Brendan Fraser. What about you versus him in the ring? Cause my God, would I watch that? All right. Well, first of all, I thought you liked me, but now you want to see me get killed in the ring. <laughs> um, so that's, that's lovely. Um, if you've seen me in the ring, it would only be one time. And Randy Orton hit me with a modified backbreaker that I'm still feeling the effects of today at 47 years old. And I'm not, I'm not even trying to sell for the guy. Like it was, it was my fault. It wasn't his fault. He told me how to take it. I just took it wrong because I was excited. But yeah, so you you won't see that match unless it's going to be the finger touch of doom. And he just points me in the chest and I drop dead and he pins me one, two, three. Brendan's huge, man. I've known him over 20 years and he's six, five, six, six. He's built like a linebacker and he's the most gentle kindest human being in the world <laughs> so maybe he would let me win maybe i could finger poke a doom him and, and and he would take the loss i don't know but i don't think he would ever punch me unless unless i was a total total jerk i can make up some lies and start spreading like say you started slagging him off i can edit this so, someone will you don't have to don't worry <laughs> did you dehydrate from the eyes like i did when he won his oscar i People get mad at me if I say this, but I don't watch award shows. They, uh, I don't, I, uh, I feel they divide actors and actors need to be more of a, 
a solidified unit, or as Peter Falk told me, a brotherhood. Of course, Peter Falk came up through the Cassavetes and that and that group of actors, and it was more of a brotherhood. They they reflected on Charlie Chaplin's uh, creation of United Artists, you know, to sort of in that. It really is actors against the producers uh, at a, a lot of the time. And uh, all these award shows kind of separate and divide these actors, you know? They're not getting paid their quote to be on that show. If people aren't watching to see the, the piece of metal they're receiving, they're watching to see the actors. So if Brad Pitt's quote is, I don't know what he gets paid, but $20 million, then you owe that man a big check if you want him there. Or you got to split that profit pool with the nominees. Like in the NBA out here, the National Basketball Association, I think they get like 53 or 56 percent and the owners get the rest. Right. So because they're the reason people are watching, they get more. So then you split your pool. They'll hate that I'm saying this. But and, and the, the actors that are nominated get what they get. It doesn't have to be half. It can be, you know, whatever a collectively bargained number is. But to me, it's just a way to divide us keeps us apart is people are competing against each other and they already changed up on the auditioning thing. So it feels like that more and more. And I just wish we had things that brought us more together um, than pull us apart. Cause it, that's why we don't get anywhere as a union in my, in my humble opinion. You don't need to watch the Oscars because I mean, I did it and stupidly last till like 4 AM here. I, I mean, I'm a type one diabetic. I drank four Red Bulls watching it. So don't do that, man. Drink water. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, thank, I'm now on like a year long detox until the next Oscars. Perfect. Let's go back to, to wrestling. So obviously I am the movie dweeb and you know, films are my thing. Wrestling, you know both wrestling and films. So I want you to help settle this lifelong debate. Who do you think is the greatest wrestler actor there is. I mean, you've got The Rock, you've got Dave Bautista, you've got John Cena. Who's who's your favorite? Well, you already said his name. Um, here's what's crazy. Bautista started out as the greenest of the three when they all first started making movie. If you look at the first stuff The Rock did, the first stuff John did, he was the most seasoned, John was, and Batista was the least seasoned. If you look at what they're able to do now, as far as range, Dave is at such a level that I don't know if the other guys get there because the other guys already have tons of success. Like both men can make any kind of movie they want, any kind of series they want, Cena or The Rock, like whatever they want, they can pretty much get it made. So I don't know if they'll have the ambition to try and get to the level that Dave is at right now. And if you look at how rapidly his, his skill has developed. We all have talent, right? Skill is the work and the sacrifice and the discipline you put in. That's when it becomes a skill. And if you watch how Dave's skill has grown, I don't think he's anywhere near where he's gonna end up. Like, the, I honestly think the sky's the limit for that dude. I, every movie he's in, he's significantly better than the last one. And I've seen everything these guys do. I love wrestlers, man. Wrestlers and comics. Those are my two soft spots. I love both those formats of art more than acting, more than music, more than anything, any writing, sculpting, anything. And so I honestly think he's the best. If you want to talk like on current rosters, that's a whole different conversation, right? Because those are people that are either cutting promos or, or saying what they want to say, which is a lot easier than when someone's writing it for you. But yeah, I think Dave's the best of the big three. I agree with you there. I think John, his commitment to being funny. You know, his comedy stuff and his serious stuff. He's money with both. Like I watch 12 rounds. Like I trust me, I, I watch everything these guys do from Scorpion King to, to what was it? Be cool or get cool. Whichever one uh, he did, Rock did the Afro on. But I, I watch everything that they've done and I've seen Rock take chances. So I know he's an artist, right? Because artists have to take chances. You have to be willing to make a bad movie. You have to be allowed to have regret as an artist. You have to be. I know that's like social media goes crazy. Like you don't appreciate this and that. It's not about that. 
it, it's just not like you have to be allowed to have a regret regardless of the reason you have to that's how artists grow we go okay i'm not going to be in that situation again because i didn't feel i was as good as i could have been and so and that's what a regret is you you learn from it you go okay it's it's not this like i don't have time for regret we all we all do we say that the older we get right because you don't want to have to think about that stuff and self-reflect but you, everyone has it and it's a good thing it's a motivating thing um so yeah i i think i think dave's the best i've seen rock take chances john hasn't taken chances yet that doesn't mean he won't i just don't know if that opportunity's been there or if he's just the roles that that he's pursuing and getting offered he's just like yo like this is a dream job i love this i'm going after this role give it to me let's go so i'm not sure what his you know what his motivation is because i don't i don't know him i don't i've only met john a handful of times when i worked there I met Dwayne a few times because him and my wife made a really bad movie together <laughs> that I'm sure they both have some form of regret. Um, it's not a bad thing. And uh, and Dave, I know a little better than the other two, um, but I'm not being biased. I genuinely feel that way about Batista. We said you've only met him a few times, but you and John have something in similar because he was famously in Scooby-Doo WrestleMania mystery. Oh, the cartoon. And you know, you know a thing or two about Scooby-Doo. Be real with me. Do ascots now give you PTSD? No. No, it's cosplay. It's cosplay, right? How, it's a character. Like, anytime you're playing a fictional or, <laughs> or factional um, character, whether it's Winston Churchill or, or Fred Jones or or Dr. Robotnik or, or, you know, Schindler, you, you know what I mean? Like it, it, what it's all, that's all cosplay. You're, you're, you're literally trying to become a character that we all know and love, right? Like Jamie Foxx and Ray. So he became Ray Charles, like his movements, his, the sunglass, everything like that's legit his job. And then the acting comes from within. So, I always loved ascots. You know, the original script had way better jokes that James wrote about the ascot, and they hit they hit hard. They hit Fred's soul in that original script. And when we got out there, they they kind of switched scripts on us, which was unfortunate. Um, but uh, but yeah, man, the original ascot jokes were way harsher, and I loved those. So no 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 ps no PTSD for me. I was going to ask about obviously. The original script were any moments dialogue sort of scenes that you can vividly remember to a degree yeah i mean it was definitely a pg-13 movie so you can infer what you want from that you know the the jokes that people hoped were true about shaggy and scooby were painted much more heavily and favorably toward those opinions the opinions on velma's sexuality were much more fun than they were in the movie the opinions on my ascot and on my sex life with daphne were much more fun but they were wanting to make something that was much more family friendly and so all those jokes just unfortunately had to go you know it was already a publicly traded company by then warner brothers and once once all these places went public and they had people to answer to it really changed the way writers get to make get to get a script approved how directors can get a movie made like there's so many late changes that i think of, of really affect the process in a negative way but it's just the norm now because until somebody wants to have a private studio but it's just i think it's just too hard to compete these days even netflix went from making you know what 30 40 movies a year down to like 14 or 17. so it's just it's a it's a tough business it's tough to invest in it because art is art. Not everyone's going to receive it well. So you can make a movie that you think is amazing and it makes $8 and everyone's like, that movie sucks. Or you can think, oh, we're going to die on this. And everyone's like, that's the greatest movie ever. So who's right? Who's wrong? N nobody is. It's art. So if you dig it, you're right. If you if you hate it, you're right. I know we spoke earlier about you re-watching some of your movies. Have your, have your kids watched the Scooby-Doo movies? Yes, they've each seen it once. Um, Charlotte watched Star Wars Rebels. My son could give a crap about Star Wars. 
Well, he's wrong. So he watches anime. He's all anime all the time. My Hero Academia, all that stuff. I like anime too. That's called Go Third. Um, but uh, but yeah. So they've seen. I think they've seen both. Yeah, not. I was gonna say not the second one, but I think they saw the second one at one of their friends' birthday party, like sleepovers. They put it on like a big screen, and they all camped outside in the backyard and watched a movie. I think it was Scooby Too. It must be cool for them to to have their dad be Fred Jones, their mum be Daphne. But it's probably not that cool when they get to watch that video from the promo where Sarah's talking about Scooby-Doo as if it's Citizen Kane. It offered so much more than every other cartoon. It was so ahead of its time. It had a story. They, they, they worked hard to figure it out. And it wasn't gender specific. It wasn't a boy's cartoon or a girl's cartoon or any of those things. It was a talking dog, you know what I mean? That was always so simple to me. And I, I don't think I had, no, I had, I think I had heard whatever. No, I couldn't have because we were all in different rooms. So yeah, that was just my honest opinion. Like when I was a kid, Scooby was cool because the dog could talk and it, it made you wish that yours could. It was, it was wish fulfillment. And then I remember like seeing like press clips long before it was ever a meme and everybody was like speaking of it. And I think by the way, like Eddie Izzard said back in the day, it's Falstaff, like it's Shakespeare. It's it's high literature. It's 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 cowardice succeeding every single week. And the only time they they actually do succeed is through failure. And that's that's high level literature. It's just a children's cartoon. So when I say that, people are like you're so stupid. And then if I say, hey, I had a bad experience with Warner Brothers, they're like, oh, you crapped all over Scooby Doo. I'm just like, which one? Which one do you want, y'all? You don't know what they did. I didn't share all those stories. I just talked 20 years after it came out and said, yo, it was a rough experience. But but yeah, man, I, I love Scooby. I've always loved Scooby. My son even got me a little Scooby Funko for my birthday um, and did some connect the dot pictures for me that he drew that I had to like follow and make and one was a Scooby. So I've always had love for it. It was just a tough, it was just a tough shoot, man. The studio was real weird with me. They were just real weird. Would you, would you want to work with James Gunn again? Because he's now head honcho at DC. I love James, but he's at a place that's always been super strange with me, man. Like Warner Brothers was weird with both Scoobies and I can't, I just can't even get into it. Like, it's just, it was too strange and I, it's something that still like affects me to this day. Like they wanted to make a movie about my dad's life and I was, and it was Warner brothers who wanted to do it. And we have the rights to that. I was like, no, like there's no, there's no way. And they were like, no, it's different. Now the, the producers that wanted to make it's different there. Now let us, you know, let us talk to them. And I let them talk me into it. And as soon as they started negotiating, I was like, ah, oh, peace out. Like there's no, you guys are worse than you were before. Like they're just, it's i don't know what their deal is with me but they have a deal with me and it's not a good one apparently um so yeah i just I, you know when he was at disney sure but uh but he's at a, a place that i guess just has weird issues with me man it was very it was very strange maybe when i'm like 60 years old and everyone who did it's dead and you know then you know it won't matter but the, a lot of these people have kids and i don't want to say stuff that makes you know, kids at their school go, oh, your dad's a piece of crap. He did this and he did that. Like, that's that's just not worth it. You know what I mean? Like, kids should be allowed to be kids and not have to deal with all that gossipy stuff. But it was weird. It was definitely not my favorite experience. Well, I'm going to jump to something that I'm hoping was a good experience from you. Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Obviously, you played Kanan in Star Wars Rebels. How was it working with the icon, the legend, the genius that is Dave Filoni? He was wonderful, man. He, you know, before each episode, he would set up every single scene, the whole story, and it would take from 30 to 45 minutes. And he's basically like walking everybody through the cast or through the, through the show as like, here's what's going on in the background. Here's what this moment is referring to in the past. Here's what this moment is gonna refer to in the future. Like everything he felt you needed to help shape the performance he did. Um, but I, you know, that was four years and I loved and still do that whole cast. I mean, I'm still really close with Taylor. Like we speak often. 
uh, still get to see him. Steve and I still speak often. He lives in Hawaii. I'm getting ready to, to live in Hawaii once I get into my later 50s, we'll retire out there probably. Um, I'm still close with Vanessa. T and I aren't close, but if we saw each other, it would be it would be all love. She just, you know, she has a, a boyfriend, they're young and in love, or I think a fiance, and they travel the world and they go to Spain for, for tapas and they go to France for wine and Africa for culture, you know what I mean? So they're going all over the place. And Vanessa and I have always been close. Like I'll always love her. So yeah, man, it was it was a wonderful experience and I and I made genuine friends, which which always feels good, man. It's Kathleen Turner back in the day said a movie is like a marriage with a guaranteed divorce. And as brutal as that is, and it's not a hundred percent true, but it's pretty damn true. So to have that many friendships last this long after is is definitely rewarding the term now is roi right return on investment like the energy we put into each other we've all sort of paid back in full and and we all have strong relationships now would you say that's been the sort of biggest sort of takeaway the biggest pinch me moment from being a part of the star wars franchise for me, it's those it's those those four people. Yeah, it's it's Tia, Taylor, Vanessa, and Steve, and and the rest of the cast that came in was super cool too. But those four and myself just had a a cool bond. That's like I said, Tia and I we don't talk, but if someone went in on her, like their ass is mine. Like I I don't play that. Like she's still family. So. We, our group has a bond that I think will last forever. We may all look at it differently and it may have a different strength to depending on who you ask. But to me, I'm an old school guy. And if if, if I say you're your fam, your family, it doesn't matter if we don't talk for 10 years, like go do your thing, live your life. If you need me, I'm here. Well, I got, I got thinking, I was like, you know what? I'd love to see you as live action Kanan in like a live action no, Star Wars Rebels. But everyone says that. No, the story was perfect. And every time they add more, it just dilutes it. Every time. When when Dave asked me to do the the bad batch thing, I didn't want to do it. I said it's gonna dilute it, man. It's gonna it's gonna lessen. No, 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 do it, do it, do it. Okay, I'll do it. And then they called for the I think it wasn't Dave on I think I've said it was Dave for the last Star Wars movie, but I think it was someone else from LucasArts that called. I can't remember. And they were like, no, please do it. I was like, how how is he that strong? Like, how is his presence that strong that it's on the level of of every great jedi that's ever walked. like nah, nah dave said it'll work yeah it couldn't have been dave because i remember they said dave said it'll work so i went in and did that and you know both those things i feel have diluted that that great death a little bit a death by the way that i had nothing to do with there's no dialogue there that's all music from kevin animation direction and storytelling now granted like ray finds in the menu there were, you know, three and a half seasons of credibility that Kanan earned with with the fans of that. So that when he does die, even if I'm not a part of it, people still come up and they're like, oh, my God, that made me cry so much. And I'm like, oh, that's so great. And they're like, what? what? Why would you say? I go, no, I mean, we're trying to make you sad. Like, I'm not trying to. But in my head, I'm like, I had nothing to do with it. Like, I just don't want to say that to him because it makes him feel bad. You know what I mean? But I, so I just try to engage and show him love and i'm glad that character connected with uh with so many people people that that love the new stuff and people that hate the new stuff they both both sides gave that character a lot of love so i'm glad it resonated with people that was that was my goal was to connect with as many of y'all as i could and uh yeah it'll it'll always be near and dear to my heart what about a live action iron ball in a dragon age remake oh i need to get all of the steroids in hollywood <laughs> um all of the what is it the human growth hormone and there's something else that people uh, no not ozempic that makes you lose weight right uh whatever makes you humongous i will get on all of that if they may i'm telling you right now if they made a dragon age movie first of all it'd be way early to bring iron bull in in the first one uh because that they didn't really have that kind of a kunari yet most of them were just very stoic and didn't much emotion because that's the way of the stoics 
Um, but yeah, man, like that would be, that's my favorite role that I've ever done. Even more than any live action thing, more than anything, it was doing the voice for the Iron Bull. He's the coolest character ever. He's the horniest guy in the world and he doesn't get any grief from anyone because he's horny for everybody. So nobody can be like, oh, well, he's a misogynist or, oh, he's this and the No, he's just horny all the time. And he's the most loyal member of that whole group. He calls everyone out on their BS. If you take him into like, you take these like, for those who don't know what we're talking about, it's a video game where you can bring three other characters that'll fight alongside you and they all have special qualities. And while you're exploring the land, they'll have these things called banters where just to fill the time while you're running from point A to point B, the other characters in your party will talk to each other. And this guy, the Iron Bull, he knew that Blackwall was full of shit. He showed the utmost respect to Vivian, like, and just like, I just loved him. I loved every single thing about him. And if I could get that buff, I don't know if there's enough steroids for me to get that big. So maybe it's a full CGI job, but yeah, I would love to do that, man. He's the best, Iron Bull's the best. I heard um, that when you first met Mark Hamill, you asked him to teach you the Joker voice. I did. This is the first time we've met. Can you teach me Iron Bull's voice? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Are you good at voices? Oh God, appalling. I'm awful at them, but I'm willing to give it a go. All right, well, you have one, you have one thing going for you because half of the accent is a British one. So but you gotta so you have to like lessen the strength of your british accent and i think you'll fall into it so basically jim i think jim cummings is the voice of thunder and pete from the mickey mouse club and thunder and pete has a voice like this and everything is like very new york old school and then winston churchill for those who don't know i'm speaking to your american viewers um, was an amazing figure in English history. He was both loved and hated and then eventually revered. Um, and they've, they've done countless like sketch comedies of him. And he's been given numerous buildings with his name on it. And he was a very famous figure from World War II. And he had this great speech where he says, we shall not flag or fail. We shall fight all. And it's this beautiful speech. So I took the Thunder and Pete voice and then you combine it with this and all of a sudden you end up with the iron bull and that's how the voice was created so it takes a little practice with both because you have to have some new york edge to it but then you have to have some refinement of the way winston would carry himself in parliament with his chest up and the belly over the pants but he held his head high he you know what i mean he wouldn't look down his nose at you because parliament's above him so he always looked very intense, like he's looking up through his brow, like Russell Crowe in Gladiator, right? When he looks up at Joaquin Phoenix and he's like, yeah, that's your fucking ass when I see you, dude. Like, it's gotta be that. So it's very, you know, hey, how you doing? And then this, and all of a sudden it becomes this. And you have, you have more, Iron Bull's much more confident than I am. Well, I'll give it a go. Oh. That's already good. It almost went Kermit the Frog. <laughs> but it started strong and then it went into like hi ho kermit the Frog. <laughs> if they do a live action the muppets though i'm your guy i'll beat you to that audition unlucky freddy you might be the one we'll see thank you so much for chatting to me for for teaching me how to do iron ball for just all of that it was so interesting man You're cool man right on i had a fun too i appreciate it thanks for the late and early birthday wishes and uh, i'll speak to you again man Good luck fixing your house with that tree. I'm not fixing it. Someone more qualified will handle that. There'll be no house if I try.